Welcome back to the Top Notch Documentaries YouTube channel. Edmund Kemper was born on the 18th of December 1948 in Burbank, California. Growing up in a turbulent home environment, Edmund came to loathe his mother for her mistreatment toward him and his father. Marital friction was present in their relationship and Ed's mother was domineering, feeling as though Ed had been coddled by her husband. Their marriage would inevitably collapse, with Ed's father abandoning the family in 1957 when Ed was only nine years old. As mentioned, Ed loathed his mother. She was controlling, mean, and impossible to please. She was always on him, demeaning him, and making him feel less than human. It severely bothered him, and around the time that his parents broke off their relationship, Ed was showing some pretty clear signs that something wasn't right. Ed was different to kids his age, being that he was significantly taller than his classmates. He was teased for this and ended up isolating himself from most people. He would begin exhibiting sadistic behaviour toward insects and animals by age 4, but this really escalated as the years progressed. Here are some of his abnormal behaviours, and these are just some of the things that Ed Kemper did as a child. Let's start off with this one. Ed beheaded his sister's dolls. He is quoted as saying, I remember there was actually a sexual thrill. You hear that little pop and pull their heads off, and hold their heads up by their hair, whipping their heads off, their body sitting there, that'd get me off. Clearly, there was something seriously wrong with Ed. Not fully satisfied with beheading dolls, Ed inevitably moved on to target defenseless animals. He harmed small dogs and cats, even going so far as to bury his family cat alive before digging it up later to behead and splay on a stick. Ed would also kill his other family cat with a machete. Cats are very much a feminine symbol, and Ed despised his mother, so there may have been some type of connection there. That, or they were just easy prey for Kemper. Ed's mother called him a real weirdo, which, let's face it, he was. And further evidence for this came in the form of a game that Ed used to play with his sisters. It was a game called Gash Chamber. The name speaks for itself. The next thing that really says a lot about Ed is when he told his sister that he'd like to kiss his teacher but only if she was dead and headless. By this point, Ed's family were very concerned but his mother didn't display any sign of love toward him. Most parents would have seeked out some form of psychological support as they want to see their child get better and actually change their behaviour. But no, Ed's mother wasn't the loving type, at least toward him. She didn't address the issues in a way that could potentially cause them to stop. She seemed to perpetuate the problem by ridiculing Ed and annoying him even more. The very disturbing behaviours continued and Ed's mother grew concerned for her daughters, Ed's sisters. Ed was clearly effed up and everyone now knew it. Because of his violent behaviour, Ed was forced to reside in the family basement. Ed's mother feared for the safety of her daughters and felt like Ed may try to R-word his sisters. God, this story just keeps getting more screwed up by the minute. This form of confinement would backfire though, as Ed became even more isolated than he already was. To Ed, his family living upstairs were practically in heaven, and he was in hell. The only company that he had were the rats that ran about in the darkness. And to a young child, I'm sure that this was very scary and damaging to his already messed up psyche. We can only speculate on why Ed's mother despised him so much. And the main reason is probably because Ed was a constant reminder of his father. His mother and father's relationship had been turbulent, with Ed's mother being the dominant force in the relationship. Ed was now a visual reminder of him, and Ed's mother despised them both. Ed's mother is quoted as saying, You're just like your father. I doubt that Ed's father was doing all of the sick things that he was doing, but it just goes to show that some of the abuse was unwarranted. Ed would run away to live with his father at age 15, but this didn't work out. Ed's father had a new family and Ed grew jealous because of the attention not being given to him. Ed returned to his mother's house having only been with his father for a month. Once again, the rejection cycle continued and Ed was sent to live with his grandparents. This took a turn for the worst when Ed's grandmother exhibited similar traits to Ed's mother. Ed would snap and murder his grandmother, shooting and then stabbing her many times. Ed moved her body and awaited his grandfather's return. Ed shot him in the head before calling his mother to tell her what he'd just done. Police were dispatched to the farmhouse and arrested Ed. Transferred to a psychiatric hospital, Ed would learn to manipulate the system. He was only 15, but managed to manoeuvre his way in the system. He was smart and could present a relatively harmless image to the doctors, 
Ed even assisted with psychological examinations of other patients and he memorised test answers to tests done on the patients. By doing this, he could cheat on tests and pretend to be normal. This strategy worked and after just four years he was actually freed. The conditions of his release stated that he should not be sent back to live with his mum. The abuse continued and Ed was now 21. It was 1969 and California society was transitioning. Santa Cruz was now liberal and it was a much more rebellious community. Ed did end up finding work on the California Highway Department crew. He routinely hung out with police in bars and was obsessed with police life. By the time that Ed reached the age of 23, he had never been on a date or had any real relationship with a woman. He was isolated and his background definitely wouldn't have made him very desirable. Not to mention the fact that he was awkward. Ed began picking up hitchhikers, mostly young women, and learned how to interact with them. He figured out how to create a relaxed atmosphere and made those in his company feel safe. And this would lead to Ed eventually picking up young women with the intent of murdering them. Despite all of the women that he interacted with whilst on drives around Santa Cruz, Ed still felt inadequate and insecure around women. His mother's voice was heard in his head as he recalled conversations that he'd had with her both past and present. His mother was working as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She had told him that he'd never attract the good-looking college girls. Ed was probably very angry at this comment, alongside the mistreatment they'd suffered earlier in life. There was insecurity, fear and rage existing inside him and his inexperience with socialising with people his own age further contributed to his damaged mindset. Ed would state, When I got out on the street, it was like being on a strange planet. People my age were not talking the same language. I'd been living with people older than me for so long that I was an old fogey. Ed continued his drives and picked up more young female hitchhikers. He fantasised about committing murder and made the comment that, If I killed them, you know, they couldn't reject me as a man. It was more or less making a doll out of a human being and carrying out my fantasies with a doll, a living human doll. I'm sorry to sound so cold about this, but what I needed was to have a particular experience with a person to possess them in the way that I wanted to. I had to evict them from their bodies. Ed prepped his car with what could only be described as a serial killer's kill kit. He cruised the highways and spotted university students Mary Ann Pesh and Anita Lucesa on May 7th, 1992. The girls were hitchhiking to Berkeley and Kemper offered them a ride. Everything seemed fine at first, with Marianne telling Kemper about her experiences with hitchhiking over in Europe. Ed went along with the conversation, but picked up on Marianne's distrust of him. She had picked up a bad vibe from Kemper. Without warning, Kemper abruptly pulled into a remote parking lot and pulled a gun. The girls were significantly smaller than Kemper and I can only imagine their terror as they couldn't physically overpower the man. He was huge and upon them trying to escape from the car doors, they couldn't do so. Kemper would later tell investigators that any attempt would prove futile. Ed had modified the door mechanism in a similar tactic to Ted Bundy. Faced with the threat of being shot, Marianne and Anita complied with Kemper. Anita was tied up and locked in the trunk and Mary Ann was alone with Kemper. Kemper forced her to strip naked but failed to perform any sexual act. He didn't know how to perform and grew enraged by this. Kemper stabbed Mary Ann to death, her screams being heard by Anita who was still trapped in the trunk. Kemper was overwhelmed by what he'd just done and realised that Anita had heard everything. He unlocked the trunk and Anita fell on the ground. Kemper stabbed Anita to death and then lifted her back into the trunk. Kemper felt as though he'd botched up the murders and drove back to his apartment in Alameda. It would later emerge that he'd been pulled over for a broken tail light and the officer had nearly searched his vehicle. Kemper was let off with a warning, but was ready to kill him if this would have occurred. Later that night, Kemper took the girls' bodies into his bedroom. There he decapitated them and put their heads into trash bags. He dismembered both of their bodies and photographed the dismemberment process to relive the experience at a later date. Ed would repeat a pattern whereby he kept victims' heads for sexual acts. About four months following this brutal double murder, Kemper picked up 15-year-old ballet dancer Aiko Ku. The team was hitchhiking and unfortunately Kemper was the person who picked her up. 
Kemper drove Ico up into the mountains of Santa Cruz. He pulled a gun once again but somehow managed to lock himself out of his car during everything taking place. Ico would be convinced by Kemper to unlock the car door at which point Kemper choked her into unconsciousness. Then he raped her before strangling her to death. Kemper followed through with his same previous ritual and gained intense enjoyment from the murder and dismemberment. Santa Cruz co to advise not to hitchhike given the recent disappearances of many young women. Girls were advised to travel in pairs and not to take rides from strangers. By this time, the skull of Mary Ann Pesh had been found by hikers and police knew that there was an active killer or killers roaming the roadways looking for vulnerable women. Adding to this fear was the serial killer Herbert Mullen. He was convinced that he needed to kill people in order to prevent a cataclysmic event. Despite all of the warnings for young people, especially women, to stop hitchhiking, not everybody listened to the message. 19-year-old Cynthia Ann Shaw was murdered by Kemper in early 1973. Kemper shot Cynthia with a 22 rifle before taking her back to his apartment to carry out his grisly deeds. 1973 would prove to be a similar year of pure devastation for young women in Santa Cruz. 1972 had been bad enough, and 1973 was looking to take a similar path of events. 22-year-old Rosalind Thorpe and 21-year-old Alice Liu were both in the wrong place at the wrong time. They'd been travelling separately, but both experienced similar events leading up to their murders. Both girls had been unlucky on the night of February 5th. It was pouring down with rain and they both just missed the last bus home. Kemper's car seemed like the best option to avoid the rainfall and both girls would end up in Kemper's car. Out of nowhere, Kemper pulled a hidden gun and opened fire on the girls. Rosalind was hit and died instantly. Alice freaked out and tried to dodge the gunfire but she was hit in the head and died in the car. Kemper drove to his mother's house and dismembered the two girls. Kemper was successfully evading capture but his paranoia and interest in police work would prove to be his undoing. Officers were tasked with tracking down Kemper because he had purchased a firearm. Given his juvenile conviction, this purchase had been illegal. Officers would confront Kemper with this news and search his trunk. There they found the illegal gun and confiscated it. Kemper had planned to kill these officers but because they remained on alert during the confiscation, he abstained from initiating a shootout. Kemper became paranoid that the police were onto him because of this interaction. He'd been following the co-ed disappearances and murders in the news and felt as though he'd been made. In reality, police weren't even close to capturing him. It was Good Friday and Kemper came home from work. His mum was in bed reading and Kemper and her began talking. Unsurprisingly, the conversation wasn't the pleasant exchange of words that Kemper had been after and he left her room to go to bed. He felt angry and was hurt by the interaction. Kemper had wanted to kill his mother since the age of eight, and it seems like all of his killings were leading up to this point. At around 5am, Kemper grabbed a claw hammer and snuck into his mum's room. He then beat her to death. Kemper would then use her head as a dartboard before shouting at her. This venting of emotion didn't fully satisfy him, because he took the murder to yet another depraved level. Kemper tried to force his mother's tongue and larynx into the garbage disposal but the remains shot back into his face. Kemper went out for some drinks before returning home to contemplate what to do next. Deciding to invite his mother's friend over, Kemper would ambush Sally Hallett from behind, lifting her off the ground. Sally's neck broke and Kemper let her lifeless body drop to the floor. His crime spree was now over and Kemper made the decision to leave town. He made it to Colorado before calling Santa Cruz police to confess to his mother's murder along with the murders of the five college girls and a child. Ed was seen as a gentle giant and officers who routinely drank with him were horrified by his admission. Ed was brought back from Colorado and wouldn't stop talking about his crimes. Kemper would later reveal that he'd actually eaten parts of his victims. It should come as no surprise that Edmund Kemper was given life in prison. He'd wanted the death penalty, but legal issues at the time would prevent his wish from coming true. Whilst in prison, Edmund Kemper worked in the prison reception centre. Edmund Kemper did more than 500 audiobooks for the blind, and he soon met Herbert Mullen in Vacaville State Prison. Kemper didn't like Herbert Mullen and felt as though his crimes were worse than his. 
Edmund Kemper still resides in prison to this day, but he continues to be a model inmate. Rest in peace to all of his victims. This has been the story of Edmund Kemper. As always, thank you for watching.